ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dame Kelly Holmes. I just totted down in my heels just to look good on stage. I did change them at the back, so. <laughs> so, um, more recently, I think you've been on, you've been to the Attitude Awards. I saw you on the UK Television Awards. Yeah. You're on Jonathan Ross on Saturday, yeah, Loose and, Women. And tonight is um, Pride of Britain. Oh gosh, it is, yes. It's tonight, eight o'clock. Um, and thank Same. you for finding time to come to a car factory in the northwest of England, um, <laughs> which um, I think we set a record for this afternoon for the tour. Of course. In half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, you said the only other factory you've been to was a biscuit factory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was going around there thinking, oh my God, this is brilliant. You know, seeing all this procedure. And I thought, God, last time I was at a factory, I was literally seeing biscuits and nicking them off the ambulators. <laughs> a <laughs> bit different to here. Um, and you said it wasn't quite what you were expecting. No, I think the enormity of it, uh, you know, you know this is a really high class, posh um, uh, a classy product, product that you're going to get. But I, don't, I, I think there's a couple of things that struck me. I didn't realise how big it would be and all in one location. There's a lot of times you hear things are made somewhere else, you know, and they're shipped over and then they come and then you get the finishing product. So I didn't realise that. And actually the range of ages that I saw on different floors and um, the women in particular being dotted around the whole uh, area of the manufacturing plant, I thought that was amazing. Yeah, I just didn't expect to see it. I suppose I don't know what I expected to see, mm -hmm. but in my head that wouldn't have been what I would have admitted. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you, you had, shall we say, a long journey to get here. In I the back did. of a flying spur, Odyssey. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a bad travel, you um, know, it wasn't a bad ride. And, and we picked you up from your village in Kent where you grew up as well. Yes. Um, Hildenborough village in yes. Kent. Um, yeah. What, what was your experiences like then, growing up as a black woman in a small village um, in Kent? Well, yeah, so I was born down there as well. Um, so my background is uh, my mother's British white was passed away, unfortunately. Um, and oh, I, don't, I have to say this very diplomatic, let's say biological father. Um, his background is Jamaican, but I don't know him or didn't know him. I met him once when I was 16. He didn't give a shit, so I just said, up okay. yours then. Um, <laughs> might as well be frank, let's face it, we all have these problems in our families, that's mine. Um, but anyway, I grew up in Kent, as I always describe it, whiter than white Kent in a village, and yep. I was the only mixed race child there. So my first indication that actually I was any different to anybody else, and I say different, I like to change that word, I like to say unique. Because if you are a standout amongst crowd, why be the same as everybody else? So um, I was at school and uh, Boney M, Brown Girl in the Ring, was the song of my era. And uh, guess who was in the ring? <laughs> it was me. And they used to sing, you know, Brown Girl in the Ring, la la la. I'd love to be able to sing. Um, and I was going, she looks like a sugar. And, blah, blah, blah. and I thought to myself, you know, and everyone was like, think, I thought, I, what, I now think, were they actually taking the mickey out of me being brown or was I just lapping it up, being the centre of attention? And I think I changed my attitude quite quickly to being unique because I just thought, well, you know, at least people know me, know my name, <laughs> you know, I'm the person that they spot out. And uh, yeah, I think um, at the time, it's hard, it's not hard to remember everything, of course, but there are prominent moments in your career. So I, I was in a care home the first five years of my life in and out because my mum had me when she was 17. So going back to Kent with a mixed race child wasn't probably the, the do think, uh, let's say. So my, da uh, my granddad, her dad said that, she, you know, until she could actually look after me. And she, given she was a single parent uh, by then anyway, um, before I was even one, I think she was quite courageous with what she did, to be honest. Mm. You know, she had a, when I was in the care home, she had the adoption services come in with all the letters to take me away and she refused, she broke down crying, refused to give them away. And I think for that, someone like that, you know, went through a lot, I feel 
you know, we didn't have a lot in common, us two. My mum thought I was a freak for all of the sport things that I did and, you know, she couldn't understand my fitness mentality and my dri being driven and career and all this was like slow down. But one thing I think I absolutely respect her for and got from her was her tenacity to never give up on something. So I feel proud of her for that. Um, but yeah, so I grew up in Kent, went to school, uh, all white schools, all white secondary school. And I was an academic, you know, so really the thing that set me apart, being unique, was the fact that I was really good at sport and everyone wanted to be in my team. Suddenly I've got a name, instead of being the one outside the classroom all the time, you know, I was the one everyone wanted to be in a school team and that gave me a sense of purpose and identity. And that's really okay. where I got that from early on. Um, uh, when, when did you really start to become excited by PE? At uh, school, because it was the only thing I liked. Um, and I think, I had a PE teacher. Now, you know teachers are meant to do a job, but there's teachers and there's really good teachers. Yeah. And mine, I believe, she was more of a mentor. That word didn't come okay. in until many years, of course, but I think she was somebody that saw, saw a talent and nurtured it. You know, because you can be part of a number in any society or place in life, but actually, when you show promise, you grow through people spotting you, opportunities that people give you, belief that people have yeah. in you, and it only takes one person to give you that. And she instilled that in me that I could be good at something, but I had to make that decision in my mind to want it as well. And actually, I mean, the truth is she sent me on a cross-country race, which I didn't want to do. I mean, who likes cross-country? Like, it's, it's, it's mud. It's always in winter, isn't it? Yeah, Rain, yeah. cold, freezing. I had an Afro hair, a seafood air, seafood air tech shirt that we were given at school and a skirt and plimpsoles, <laughs> like white plimpsoles with high, white knee, high knee socks. Why are you going to like cross-country? I mean, really? Anyway, I come second in that cross country against a girl that was really good and I was gutted losing like first time I had this like, <laughs> you know, oh my God, I don't like to lose. And that was it. I was on a mission from that day. So, so would you describe those teachers as allies as well as a mentor? Um, it's like something we've been focusing a lot with our, some of the networks. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose when you have a part to play in anything, you can just look at your role and that's all that matters. But when you look outside of the box, mm. you can see different things. So she had a role to play. She had to teach us as a PE teacher, whatever that meant. We had to do some physical activity much better than at school than it is now. I know that. Um, and I think she just was went out, so, out of her way almost to ensure she got the best out of her students. Okay. It wasn't just a job for yeah. her, it was a passion to see us as young kids be the best we could be. And if she identified a talent, she wanted to nurture that talent for as far as it would go. And, I, and she's still at the school, can you imagine? Really? She's still working at the school. Is that not insane? Gosh. Why? I mean, why be a PE teacher in the first place? Yeah. But to be it for like nearly 40 years, I mean. <laughs> so she, she's really great. Okay, and then and you... actually, I'll quickly say, she's yeah. the first person I thanked when I won my two gold medals when I came back from Athens. Wonderful. I called her and I said thank you because without oh. you believing me, I might not be this person. And she's now a friend. So. Oh. Um, we were talking earlier about how um, one of the things we're trying to do with inclusion here at Bentley is um, encouraging people to be whatever they want to be, fulfil their full potential, regardless of background. Mm. And I think you're a great example of someone who can do that. Well, I fit, as we established, all your five <laughs> pillars. I was like, I am your person. <laughs> you just need to spread me everywhere and give me a car now, because I am <laughs> your person. <laughs> but no, I, Moving I, on. I, <laughs> um, so, um, you entered the army at the age of 18. Yep. Um, uh, yeah. Maybe why? Um, how was your time there? And, and how did that influence your running career? Um, okay, taking it back slightly, I started after being encouraged to run. Um, that was sort of then my, I felt my purpose as a young person. So you had all these targets to go to, like English schools, championships. Um, I wanted to do that. I won my first one when I was 13. And then over the years, I got good enough to be selected to run for Great Britain in the Mini Youth Olympic Games when I was 17, and I won a gold medal. Oh. And I stood on that bus trim thinking, oh, maybe one day I, this might come true, because I was inspired by the Olympics when I was 14. I mean, realistically, since I was 14, 
I only ever knew two things I wanted to do. That was to be Olympic champion and to be in the army as a physical training instructor. At the age of 14? At the age of 14. Wow. So I watched the Olympic Games. Sebastian Coe, does anyone remember that name? Yes. Is there any old people in here like me? Um, yeah, Sebastian Coe. He was one of the greatest middle distance runners. He won a gold medal in the uh, Los Angeles Olympic Games for 1500 meters. I'd mm. already started two years before and I was like, oh, this is brilliant, you know, seeing somebody from your country sort of, it's, it didn't matter whether it was a man or a woman, it's just seeing somebody representing Great Britain standing on that podium, gold medal around their neck, flying the flag in an event that I was aspiring to be good at. Yeah. And again, that's that visualization and seeing heroes and role models in front of you. That was that. And then the army, a bit different. So we had um, careers officers come round to our school, showed us videos of Navy, Army, Air Force, Air Force, they didn't show flying planes, which I was a bit gutted about, because I think that I might like that. Yeah. They just showed the administrative side. Oh. Not being academic, it was not gonna happen. Then they showed Navy, ships at sea. I couldn't swim when I was 14, <laughs> okay. so that wasn't gonna no. happen. Maybe. Then they showed the army, the soldiers. They showed everyone getting down dirty under the scramble nets over the 12 foot wall, swinging on the ropes. I said, like, yes, that's me. I wanna be both the one getting down dirt and screaming and shouting. So I kind of had then a career pathway in my head because university wasn't my language. Mm. Um, you know, it was getting jobs, you know, sure. going, leaving school at 16, getting a job, working out what I wanted to do, going sure. for a career. I chose the army. I joined a month before I was 18, as I uh, got my heavy goods vehicles license oh, really? when I was okay. 18, yeah. up in Leconsfield. That's this high up, isn't it? I mean, I come from south right down there. Isn't Leconfield up this way? To the northeast. Leconfield's that way, isn't yeah. it? Northeast. Yeah. It's got to be as high Thank as you, you lot. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I didn't realise how far yeah. up you were. Um, anything over the M25 is north for me. Uh, yes. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I became a driver and then I wanted to become a physical training instructor, which I did. You're based in the UK? I was always based in the UK, always yeah. posted in the UK yeah. around. And um, I loved my career, to be honest, as a soldier. It's what I always thought I was going to do for years. Yeah. And then actually, I gave up my junior international career to join the military to the despair of my coach, who always thought I could be like this really great senior international athlete and like cried the day I went into the yeah. army. And I didn't want to tell the army that I was a good runner because I wanted to be a really good soldier. And I thought if I just thought I was running, that's all they thought I was be good at. And I always wanted to prove I could be something better than just yeah. a good runner, if that makes sense. Yes, it does, yeah. But when you're beating the guys mm. on your basic fitness test, it's pretty obvious <laughs> that you can run. <laughs> so they got me in the army athletics team and then the history goes through, you know, I was multiple inter-services champion, army champion. Then I got the chance to do a civilian race that probably brought on my talent to be an international athlete when I was 22 years old. You might ask me a question, so I don't want to go too no, no, far no. with so, my... So, so, when, when was, so where was that, that race? So, um, to be an Olympian or to be uh, good enough to go to a Commonwealth Games, European champs or world champs, the only way you get into those, those, and it doesn't really matter what age you are, um, is you have to qualify at a national championships, meaning you have to get in the first two at your national championships, and then there's a third discrepancy place, is that the word? And then um, get the qualifying time for that championships, which in middle distance running for 800 metres for women, it's like sub two minutes, you have to run yeah. under two minutes for 800 metres, which is two times around that track. Wow. Um, so that's the only way you'll ever get qualified. So anyway, I got encouraged by the army to go to this national championships. So I get announced as Corporal Holmes. Everyone was looking at me thinking, oh my God, you know, kind of Corporal Holmes, a bit weird to be announced at a civilian race. Anyway, I didn't, I didn't really care. I was a strong woman, I was a soldier, you know, I was kind of like just going to do another race. This guy came up to me and said, follow these two, they're going for the world championship qualifying time. Well, of course, I didn't think that was in my psyche. I'm just turning up at the civilian race. Well, I chased them, beat them, and got the qualifying time okay. in that race. So off I go to Skubga in a world championships, you know, so naive, even at 23 at the time then, 
going to world championships, being in a world-class team with the likes of back then, Linford Christie, Sally Gunner, yeah, like all of yes. our, you know, really brilliant athletes. And I'm just a soldier, you know, kind of in the team thinking, this is just amazing, you know. And then I go back, go back to barracks and forget that I've changed all my guard duties to go away. And next thing I know, at two o'clock in the morning, I'm guarding the barracks in my Gosh. combats with my weapon. You know, that was my life. It was, <laughs> it was very parallel, universe life I led. Um, we've had a question from one of the networks, Shah, in fact. Um, being, being a mid-distance runner like yourself, I sort of, Shah, I should say, clearly not me, um, has had my ups and downs physically and mentally. Mm. How do you go about overcoming setbacks to come back stronger, which ultimately led you to winning the double gold? Oh, gosh, it's hard. You know, um, so anyone that doesn't follow sport but sees the Olympics, because I think sometimes you might not even really watch sport that much on telly, but when the Olympic Games comes, you see all the packages before it, you get inspired by the movement, you want to be like proud to represent your country, wherever that's from, you, you know, you're behind everybody. And I think that there's definitely a point where when I won two gold medals, certain people were thinking, where's she come from? It's like, really? well, okay, let me say, <laughs> let me state the facts, is that I was an international athlete for 12 years, I'd won 11 11 uh, international medals prior to winning two gold medals at Commonwealth Games, European Champs, World Champs and previous Olympic Games yes. and all off the back of having seven years of injuries as within that 12 years, stress fractures, ruptured calves, torn Achilles, gland fever, tonsillitis, three operations on my stomach, you name it, I had it. That affected me physically and mentally sure. because when you're trying to push yourself up to be excellent, so this is to be the absolute best and there is a standard to reach i.e you have to be the best in the world whoever turns up you've got to beat them of course it's going to have a pressure it's going to have a pressure on your body because there's a fine line between being really really good and being too good i.e getting injured because you don't really know when the limit's going to come you know you can only go by the times you run on yeah. the track the sessions that you do and the times that equate to what you might race in so you push and push in to get to that. Getting injured, you go down. Um, and then, you know, the highs and lows of sport are quite dramatic. So the highs are cool. So standing on a rostrum, you know, with a medal around your neck and thinking this is just the best thing. And at that period of time, you forget everything else that's happened to you. Unfortunately, that one moment in a diary on an end of a championship where you've ran two minute race or under four minute race for 1500 meters it all goes in that pot that bit the hour after but what about all the hours and days and minutes and times you've cried you've walked off in pain you've been on a massage bed a physio bed you've cried yourself to sleep because you think your career's over that you're so injured that everyone tells you you haven't got a life in this anymore and that's what you feel that you have in life you know they have the they're the parallels of it. So the moments that everybody s celebrates glory, which is brilliant, because yeah. those highs are high, people don't see the work to get there. But I think that's in anyone's life. But, but, but how, how do you find the self-control and the determination to keep going when you have these setbacks? And you have to have belief, you know. I think anyone in life needs to have purpose, needs to have dreams and aspirations, because that can get you through the dark times. You know, and um, for me, as a sports person, having now obviously we're going to go into another conversation so there's a little bit more to this story but at the time it was about that was my dream i felt that was my destiny at the time to become olympic champion mm. so my driver was always that so when anything went bad i still think oh, i've still got this to hook on so an example of that being my first ever injury when i was serving full-time in the military 26 years old I gave up my leave to go and join. I'd already become double world uh, medalist, double you know, Commonwealth Games champion and European uh, silver medalist prior to this first Olympic Games, being a full-time full soldier, using my leave to go away and compete. I get to my first Olympic Games. I was, I was in the top three in the world at that time. And I remember flying to Tallahassee, our holding camp prior to those Olympics, thinking, oh, I've got this real weird feeling in my leg like it's just aching you know like you fly so 
far somewhere, you know, kind of, you know, everyone yeah. gets swollen, don't they, when the flight, I think, oh, what is this? I think that's just a flight. So I went to see the doctor, didn't really think anything of it, thought he'd give me some anti-inflammatories, did a scan, he said, you've got a stress fracture. And he said, you've got to go home. I was like, oh. I said, what's the other alternative? He says, well, if you run and fall, you're likely to break your leg completely. I said, okay, I'll take that risk. So I ended up running the Olympic Games with a stress fracture. I used to inject the bone here to numb the pain. Ouch. At first, for the heats in the semi-final, that was enough just to let me run. Then, of course, the emotion of it, thinking I was like a potentially medalist here, and now feeling like it was all being sort of unraveled in that moment. And I remember going out uh, to the final, and I just had another injection, but it hit the bone site. It was so painful, it like, felt like it ricocheted. So of course I'm in tears going to the, uh, in the bus to the stadium to warm up to then perform to be at an Olympic Games, trying not to let anybody know. And this is the thing, with anything we go through, how many times do we go to work where no one knows really what you feel like? No one knows what you've gone through before you left mm. the door. Mm. It was the same in sport, I had that same thing of putting a mask on. Anyway, I did run those Olympic Games and actually in the final I came fourth. I got pipped on the line by the thickness of this with a stress fracture. So my Goodness. mentality for my, my whole career, instead of going with the initial thing is distraught, you know, it's all gone wrong and I hate everything and why bother? And then I thought, hold on, if I can come forth in the Olympic Games running with a stress fracture, I must be quite good. So I also used to turn negatives into positives and that's what I did from that moment throughout my whole career. Every injury in those seven years, it was like, well, if I can be number one in the world uh, in Sheffield, I got the, um, I broke the British record that's been had stood for like 12 years in the 1500 meters yeah. and I broke it and it made me number one in the world so of course going into the world championships I've been gold medalist right of course I've got to be gold medalist uh-uh nope I got a niggle in my Achilles went for treatment the week before the world championships turned up thinking right I can do this running round completely ruptured my calf from here to here, tore my Achilles tendon. First race, the first day, ironically, in Athens. Then I thought, well, you know, if I can be number one in the world, I can get back. So I went through that yep. as my career. So that's what I mean by highs and lows. You push yourself because you have that ultimate belief as a, an a elite athlete that you can do something, otherwise why bother? You can just be a club athlete. So that's the mentality that you're born with, I think, or you learn to have. And then, it can go horribly wrong. So you pick yourself up, go. And I had a really bad, I will go into this now, I don't know if we are, but um, I had my first really bad mental health problem when I was 33 years old, which was the year before winning the two gold medals. Some of you know that, a lot of you won't. Um, I basically was in holding camp, getting ready for world championships. I'd gone through the whole, whole highs and lows of this. I still felt like I was in the game. Like, I don't know what it is. You know, if you, some people will have had this, I know they would have in life. I think you, you're going to be something or there's something else for you, you know, whatever that is. You know, you're going to have your best car or, you know, <laughs> get married and your partner's going to give you the best rock, you know, whatever it is, you know, <laughs> all these aspirations. But I just believed I could be Olympic champion. Anyway, I got a niggle again and I just thought, I can't do this. Got in a what again? A though? niggle, like an yeah, okay. injury. Yeah. Uh, I thought, I can't do this. So I'm in the holding camp. I lost the plot. I literally, well, I went into the bathroom and I had a breakdown. I didn't know what breakdowns meant, but I definitely do know. Um, I lost it. Some people call it black hole. Some people call it the black dog. You can call it anything. When you can't see anything, but this is screaming in your head and nothing is rational. And I wanted the floor to open up. I wanted to jump in. I didn't want to see tomorrow. Saw some scissors on the side. I just decided to cut myself in places that nice. I could hide. And I was in a bad, literally lowest of the low. Uh, yet, on the other side, which is really weird to comprehend, is I was wanting to live because I had a dream. I still wanted and believed I could be Olympic champion. So for me, that was my savior. Still knowing there's something for you. It's like when you're in a really bad place, sometimes you don't know how to handle it. But then 
sometimes the flashes of what really matters, your family, your friends, your life that you do lead. There are other things that why we want to live as well, but we don't know how to cope with the bits at that period of time. And mine was Olympics. So you can imagine getting ready for World Championships being in that space. I still won a medal at that World Championships. And I stood on that rostrum thinking no one knows what I'm going through, but look at me. And I knew I couldn't go any lower. So what happened was, is coming into 2004, I told everyone around me that was part of my team, like my physios, my masseurs, my training partners, my coaches, didn't tell them anything about the mental health problems. I didn't, still didn't know at that time. We didn't speak about mental health back then in 2003. I didn't really know or understand what I was going through. So how could I then explain yeah. it? And also I didn't want to put a negative vibe on the team because I mean, it's not, but it, that's what you think. Anyway, so I told my team, look, I need you to help me. I need you to be the best physio, the best coach, the best. We will be good. I said, I'm struggling because I just need to keep injury free. I know if I'm injury free with all the hell I've gone through, yet yeah, I've won all these medals. Like surely if I get one year where it is perfect, I can do this. And that's what happened. So everybody galvanised their own way of thinking. So back then, my conversation is very different to what I might go on to tell you about in a minute in terms of speaking in a different language around mental health. But back then, it was about how do I bring people on side who I give, it's about both of us. Yeah. So by me winning, I wasn't the only person that should have won medals on, out of my team because my physio was from Leeds. She was working at a university. You know, she was a university physio. And I said to her, I said, look, you're a brilliant physio, but no one really knows about you. What if you become a physio to an Olympic champion? Remember, I was only going for one gold. The two was like, oh. Um, but I said, what if you become a brilliant physio by supporting an Olympic champion? Because I'm going to win, mm. you know. Wow. It raised her own vision of how good she could be and what part of the team her part was it's like being in here this does not become this unless the people work on it and every part of this organization do their bit to the absolute excellence to get an excellent product to be excellent that's exactly the same that's a gold medal there I don't become a gold medalist without everybody else's part to play. And that's how I looked at it, is that we're all a team. So I suggested that to all of my team and it transformed everybody. And together we became the belief that I had was to be Olympic champion. But then I won two. And if anyone remembers my face, <laughs> winning 800 meters, is like eyes popping out the head, like, oh, I think I did it, you know, it's kind of- I wish you had a picture, sorry about <laughs> you that. You should, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so um, you deal with mental health Lots of different ways. Maybe we go through the well, realistic life of mental health in a minute. You, you mentioned, you talked about wearing about masks yeah. a few minutes ago. And, and then um, um, we, we were speaking earlier about um, your, your pain being in the army and, and not yeah. being yourself. Yeah. And I also heard you on, on Jonathan Ross on Saturday night mm. making a very impassioned statement. Do you maybe want to share what that was? Yeah, so again, some of you may or may not have seen the documentary that I had out on June the 26th this year. Um, that documentary was called Kelly Holmes Being Me. And basically, the documentary was about me announcing publicly that I was a gay woman. Something that I'd never spoken about, wasn't able to speak about, um, but I had to speak about. And the reason being is that I served in the military uh, when it was against the law to be gay or against the law to be anything under the LGBT movement at that time. From, um, and the consequences of that instilled fear in me for 34 years, because I always feared the fact that if I had admitted that I had served as a gay woman during the gay ban, that I could still be jailed, which was the consequences of some people that got found out. Those consequences weren't as simple as being jailed. They were, um, brutal beatings, sexual assaults, rape, um, court martialing, jailing, you name it, people's lives have been ruined through that um, law. I was, I suppose, one of the lucky ones that just was mentally tarnished with it, uh, but still 
stop me being me for my whole life. Um, I'm now on a campaign. Now I have my voice to get justice for the thousands and thousands of mm -hmm. veterans that are still suffering and did suffer during that time. So there's a review that's out by, led by Lord Etherton. It's um, looking at the injustice of veterans during the years of 67 and 2000. The ban got lifted in 2000, which actually now, ironically, you know, is the best, one of the best employees for diversity and inclusion. You can be whoever you want now. You know, it's against the law to be homophobic. It's against the law to have, you know, to be anything uh, against anything within the DNI categories. Um, but. Whilst that's good, and I have a very complex relationship with the army because I served, I loved my career, I loved being a soldier, I really did. And I'm an honorary colonel with the Royal Armoured Corps Regiment, which I have been for four and a half years, so now people have to salute me, which I quite like. Because <laughs> I, I never got it when I served, so I, like, I might as well take it now. Yeah. They owe it to me. Um, <laughs> but no, um, so on one hat, I am promoting how good it is to have a service career. And I would advocate that, to be honest. Mm. There's like over 380 jobs that you can have. You know, you've got a roof over your head, you've got pay, you know, you have good camaraderie, you get a chance to travel, do sport. So from a young person's point of view and how it grew me as a young person, it was brilliant. But on the other side of that, I always, I'm a person now, especially because I'm clear ahead because I've now got this space rather than the fear and the kind of frustrations that I've had that have caused me many mental health problems right up until doing the documentary. Um, I now believe that we walk, all of us, and especially in all these bits, on the shoulders of people that have gone before us. People have made change and movement to us to get to the point that we can mm. have these conversations and things sure. in all different areas of life. But with the veterans, you know, these are people that might have served for over 15 years, got a long service medal. Long service medals for good conduct, meaning you did your job well. That's stripped off of them the moment they're, they're found out to be gay or alleged to be gay. Okay, alleged. There is uh, heterosexual people that were also kicked mm. out of the military for assumed to be gay. Okay, this is the wrong bit. Um, I've been interviewing loads, I've been promoting loads as I did on Jonathan Ross this sun Sunday in the Sunday Mirror. I've interviewed three veterans with two with harrowing stories. Um, but my mission is we get as many people come forward Good. to submit their evidence for the review. The review gets written up. It go, it, we end the review on the 1st of December, it gets written up to go to the government in May uh, with a, a whole out, hopeful outcome of a public apology, yeah. meaning a state apology, because we, um, you bear your oath to the allegiance to, it was the Queen, now the King, so to the Crown, not the government. But we want to see some compensation new measures being put in place, mm. but that doesn't mean individually because you can't quantify that. But what you can do is put a pot of money in for people that have suffered mental pro problems that have led to physical health problems, that of homelessness that we're still having. People have lost family, friends, pensions, so much. You know, people are destroyed just because of that law. And I want to use my voice to now give justice to others and my platform to do that. I'm not paid to do this. I want to do this because I believe in it. And one of the things that I've got to in my head is that, yes, a law gets put in place, but a law was fundamentally that you couldn't live a life that they thought wasn't appropriate because it was a risk to soldiers on the front line. I mean, really? And the last thing you're thinking about is if you fancy someone when you're getting shot at, let's face it. But that's how ridiculous the law is. But there's a one thing having a law and saying, right, you're broken the law because we know you're gay, you're kicked out. Right? You lose your job, you feel bad about it, you want a career, you don't like it. But who has the damn right to take that law into their own hands and physically abuse people by means of absolute physical abuse beatings to sexually abusing to raping people to cause in their life a life of misery that they now can't live it no one has the right to do that and that's why I've got to this point of really pushing it so that my language is to the government that people took the law into their own hands that wasn't right 
whilst we can't get that back from perpetrators, you can do something for those survivors of that. And that's my mission right now. Well, good luck. <laughs> um, um, maybe just last question for me. Um, we're walking around and so you've been doing some filming and um, <laughs> follow you on social media. If you don't, please do. It's fantastic. Um, I'm sure not everyone is supportive of you on social media. How, how do you deal with that? To be honest, I mean, I don't see anything that's nasty. Okay. I mean, I'm sure there's people that say it's nasty, but that's in the world, isn't it? That's in society. You know, there's a bag deck, bad eggs everywhere. Uh, do you know what? I, I've got to a point in life where I can't fear anything anymore than what I've feared for all my life. So, you know, words are words. And it's, what can I do? No one's going to accept everybody. But I do think when we're talking about all of these areas that we're talking about, it's about having conversation educating people yeah. and informing people because most people have an issue of things when they don't understand so they have yes, a perceived agreed. issue yeah. of something you know mm. they think oh this fight why are you fighting about this because you know why does it matter well, it's because you don't walk in the shoes that other people walk it doesn't matter to you because it's not affecting you but why do you have a right to then bring somebody else's down so there's a language that i think we have to change when we're talking about different subjects about educating people. I think there is a crossover with talking about issues because when I was, we were looking for all your five silos when I realized I'm in all of them, um, I thought to myself, well, everyone has their own issues here and you can write them all down. But if you go back to everybody and you all sat down together, I bet you there's so many common issues. It might not be exactly the same wording or the exactly the same issue by, you know, ethnic minority to women in terms of right, but lack of opportunities, prejudice, judgment, kind of um, uh, fear of kind of uh, being rejected, kind of, I don't fit in that mould. I bet that goes across everybody, to be honest. Mm. So for me, it's about communication within, you know, especially in this landscape where you've got the chance to make changes here. In society, we need to do the same thing. We need to kind of be clear. Um, I think about normalising conversation is better. The more we talk about it, it normalises it. Sure. The less we talk about it, the issues we still have. You know, so talk about the worries, talk about the fears, talk about we don't get these opportunities. Because if people don't know about them, they can never give them to you. That's one, another thing. Uh, these are things I'm learning. You know, I'm not here to preach. It's just my life has been quite colourful. Um, I've learned a lot. <laughs> quite colourful, yes. Feel a lot, felt a lot. Um, and so that's what, those are some of the things I've come. When it comes to mental health, um, I do believe in communicating. I believe you have to uh, talk, you have to share, you have to get anything that's in here and off because it can leave you to a lifetime of misery. You know, in the moment you release that, it's like a whole new being, you know. But I do think there's also this kind of, it's again, it's only my own analogies of this walking on eggshells type thing. So if I was with friends and I thought, and I do have friends, um, that they're isolating themselves a little bit more. They're not communicating on our WhatsApp group as much as they did. I'm thinking something's not right with them. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'd make a point of contacting them and just saying, oh, hi, you're not, you know, I haven't seen you around much. You're not saying a lot. You're not, you know, what's going on? Is everything okay? I don't say, are you okay? Because what's the okay. common answer? Yeah, I'm okay. Because yeah. you don't know how to either yeah. approach the subject or you don't want to burden yeah. someone with yep. the subject. So there's these two people. One walks on eggshells and thinks, should I approach it? And sometimes you don't want to approach people, I think, in a workplace because it can open a can of worms that you're not either ready for or you're just scared of. But I do think that's not as bad as you think. You know, it's just somebody having to release something and just knowing you've got somebody that cares or can listen can make a difference to that person and it's exactly the same if somebody wants to speak there's always somebody that can speak to you we sure. all have either a friend a colleague a um a charity a professional that we can go to and open up to the hardest thing is that first move and i know that if you watch my documentary first two minutes 
well, it wasn't actually, it was a lot longer than that. It was probably about 10 minutes. It looks like two minutes on the documentary. Actually, it looks about 30 seconds on the documentary, but it took me 10 minutes to actually go, I just want you to know that I'm a gay woman. And it's not because I'm ashamed. I'm not ashamed of myself. I'll put that out there. And I've been a gay woman since I was 18 when I first realised when I joined the army that, yeah, maybe I'm gay. Um, but... You know, when you have so many fears and worries around your being, you, it's debilitating. It just stops you even thinking straight, even feeling properly, and you just build up. And over years and years and years, you build up such a barrier and a wall that to break that down is so hard. But I can honestly say to anybody now, like I've lived through that, and my biggest thing is I now I can talk to people is please don't live in that vein because I know how bad that is. And I can sit used people used to say to me, but why don't you you know my friends and family, but why don't you say things, you feel so much better. Oh yeah, it's that easy, you know, you ain't going through everything. It's not that easy, but the moment you do, I can honestly say, the past, not, not initially, after June, I was still sort of still terrified of what people would say and what people would think and like waiting for the moment, like seeing it on my social media, like thinking, oh. <laughs> you know, it's like, and, and the, the funniest bit was I had a date in the diary, which was the 26th of June, and we've been working, I've been talking to a production company for quite a while about doing this, um, and, um, and then it obviously took a lot of filming. And 26th of June, so I had this date, I'm thinking, right, a countdown. And then the newspaper wanted to do an article, but the article had to come out the Sunday before, on the 19th. And I was like, no, no oh. way are you putting this newspaper article out, because I built myself up now yeah, to this yeah. big sort of moment. And suddenly, like, they wanted this out, and I went into this whole shell of, oh my God, no way, you can't be telling everybody that I'm a gay woman, you know, it's really weird. But your mindset goes to the thing. But, as I say, the first two months, it was sort of comprehending it all. I went to Pride for the first time ever. I mean, I'd never been to Pride. I wouldn't even wear a rainbow badge for fear of somebody going, oh, you're definitely gay. And I can say that assumption in any walk of life does not free people. Me assuming who you are, what you do, what you feel, where you've come from, you know, what you have, what you haven't got, does not free the person dealing with the issues. Assumption is people's freedom, you know. A, Sorry, freedom is yeah. their, their voice is their freedom. So assumption is not freedom, freedom is your voice. You being able to speak about it, share about it, articulate it, get the opportunity for that, free somebody okay. from the hell that they can be in. So they're my kind of words of wisdom. Thank you. What I've learnt. Thank you. And the documentary was on ITV, uh, wasn't it? Yeah, so it's so on still ITV, on the ITV Hub. Hub. Yeah, yeah it's, still, it's called Kelly Holmes Being Me. It's worth a watch. I mean, it covers a lot of subjects. It covers mm. the bereavement and things, which was the start of my journey four and a half years ago when my mum passed away of me needing to change. It talks about burnout from work, overworking because I was stopping these constant narratives in my head of needing to explode and just free myself and it was a constant narrative during lockdown i had covid in lockdown seeing the awful things that were going on telly and watching how devastating whether you believe it or not but seeing a lot of people that were dying thinking you know laying on my sofa for three weeks thinking god you know something happened when something happens to me all my friends and family are going to be at my funeral saying oh isn't it a shame that she couldn't live her life i'm like no that's my right to live my life you know, so then I went through this whole journey, had a burnout, thought I was going to take three weeks off, took 10 months off. During that time, I had a big breakdown, decided that if I don't do something now, then it could be really serious. So that was the journey that it took to get to today. It's been a tough one, but I'm the happiest I've ever been. I've never been happy in my life. This is the obvious thing. I live life because I did. I've been successful. And like, don't get me wrong. I mean, winning two gold medals was pretty cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I had a lot yeah, of smiles. Yeah. And I can smile a lot. But um, yeah, I can like truly being free and happy and feeling it is like now. You know, I can be who I want to be. I can say the things that are passionate about me. I can hopefully talk to people more authentically. If I had enough to before that point I could talk about being a mixed race kid and a white and the white you know yeah. growing up I could be a care home kid I could be a soldier I can be you know Olympic champion I can be a mental health advocate I could have been all those things about telling that I'm a gay woman 
but I need to tell you that because this is who I am and I don't, I'm no different to the person who celebrated running around the track winning the medals. It's just helped me be freer. That's it. Thank you. Shall we get some questions from the yeah, audience? Go okay. for Okay, have we got the mics ready? And please do, because I spent my la I've spent the last two years on Zoom, um, looking at myself. And, and, for, and for anyone on Teams, <laughs> hello people on Teams, um, you can submit your, your questions as well, yes. <laughs> it's Who nice to, to have first? faces in front of me. Oh, go on, Tom, please. Tom in the front room. You need to wait for a mic and then... Could, could you stay, if you stand up, then we can I know where you are. Thank you, Tom. Hi, Kate. First of all, thank you so much for coming in today and for being thank a role model for speaking up. I think it's incredible. I wanted to ask you, when you came out this year publicly, what's that brought to your life? And have you got any words of encouragement for people that maybe are considering coming out in the workplace or more publicly? Yeah, for sure. You know, to be your true, authentic self opens you up as a person to other people. You know, you get more out of that person. You feel more equipped to talk uh, more openly and just to have richer, truer conversations. That's what's happened with me. You know, I've known a lot of people throughout my life, a lot of uh, sports colleagues, you know, really world-class sports colleagues, a lot of people in business, a lot of people in all different walks of my life. I would never have just a normal conversation. It would be very functional. It would be very about, about the thing that I'm with them for, you know. Um, about sport, about the army. I would never just uh, invite people to go for a coffee or have, you know, just go for a drink or go for lunch or go out for a night out. Now I'm living my best life. I am party animal, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm not sure that's good. If you watch my social media, it's not always pretty. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it just gives you a bit more flair about you. You can show who you are. And it's not about, I'm navigating this world for the LGBTQ plus community. You know, I'll be very open with you, sitting this side behind the screen, as I were, and um, watching the involvement over many years from LGB, as it was when I, in the 80s, the AIDS pandemic, to LGBT, and then becomes uh, the Q and the A and the I. And I, I was one of those people that said, bloody hell, it's an alphabet now. Like, because I was thinking, why, why is all this? You know, why are people pushing this down your throat? You know, sitting there in my closeted life, there's no one knowing that I'm actually a gay woman and part of that community, really, if I wanted to be. Um, it was because I think we are getting to a point where we are lacking in the education of things. So when I did my documentary, I spoke to a lady called Lady Phil from yeah. um, Black yeah. UK Pride. So I asked her two questions. I said, why do you want to segregate? Why, when we're trying to unite, why do you want something called Black UK Pride? And she said, the problem is, is that in ethnic minorities, cultural environments, religious environments, the journey has even more um, issues to uphold. So you want to feel a place of a, a safe space. You want to feel that people around you under those banners, let's say, uh, understand the fight that you're coming from. Because of course we all have different fight, all different levels. And when it comes to all the letters that are now there, the best way I can articulate it, and in my very simplistic mind sometime, is that if we were all painted, if, you, if I was painted blue, and there was not one other blue person that I ever see in my life, what's that gonna make me feel? Completely intimidated, probably isolated. I would not want to go out because I'd probably be blue, bullied. I'd probably be looked at as a freak. I'd probably be all these things. But the moment I found another blue person, <gasps> Oh my God, there's someone that looks like me. I've got something in common. I can finally breathe. So when it comes to articulating all of the LGBTQ plus things, it's about giving someone something that makes them feel validated, that somebody else looks and feels and has the same mindset as you. And that's why it's spread out. It's very easy if you think about it like that, rather than thinking, oh God, everyone wants a title, everyone wants to be in this. It's just because people need some validation, a community and a way and a purpose of just feeling that you can have a normal life of conversation rather than skipping the conversation about word, you know, and dare not to say this word that no one else gets. But we have to be, we have to educate that. The community has to 
not throw things down people's throats. So every one of your five areas, it's not about dictating what you want in life and saying, I deserve this and I want this. In some cases, you might well deserve it if you are you know, really good at what you do or have a purpose and a presence. But if you talk to people about it, for me, it's about inclusion is rich, for diversity is rich, different people bring a different part to play. We all have a different upbringing. We all have a different history, a, a lifestyle. Some have been here for God knows how many years and some have just started. You know, the person just started maybe the big techo freak. You know, it's like bringing a new world to somebody that's 65 who's been here and is so precise and knows exactly what they're doing. Don't mess with my chain. You know, we all have something to bring. So why then should it be a barrier to those that are fighting for something? Why should a woman fight for a spot? on a board, if they're bloody good enough, put them up there. You know, why should somebody from the LGBT community be fearful and not have a space environment to be who they are in a workplace through fear of prejudice, through fear of, you know, bullying and barriers. We should be able to be a community of people that just talk. We don't always have best friends. You know, just because I'm a gay woman doesn't mean I like every gay woman that's out there in terms of whether they're a good friend. It doesn't also mean that I fancy every gay woman. You know, there's those misconceptions mm. of things, yeah. unfortunately, uh, in life. But we can only do this by talking. And educating. Educating. And you doing what you do is these steps to doing that. Thank you. Okay. Who wants to go next? Few more minutes Come left. on, bring it on, please. <laughs> Randev, you want to ask? Go on, please. Um, earlier you mentioned um, it may be difficult to sometimes ask someone if they're okay. Any advice you have in giving like someone like myself, if I was to ask someone else, if, how would I go about asking the question, if, are you okay? Like, is, there, is everything okay in your life, sort of thing, the advice? Yeah, I suppose it's just language, isn't it? Most things are language. I think personally, I think a lot of people in this sector and especially for the mental health sector, sort of talk about it being a fact of noticing difference or just saying, oh, you don't quite seem yourself. I'm here for you, you know. Um, even sort of saying, look, I'm, I'd love to go for coffee with you. Preempting the fact that actually you want to ask them a little bit more about them, but you kind of just start in that, that journey rather than just going, oh, are you, are you okay? when somebody's sort of come in a little bit subdued, that are you okay doesn't really open enough to go mm. because if, I, if I'm really feeling struggling that day, I'm just gonna say either yeah or yeah, I'm all right. And then I move on quickly, I scuttle away, you know? So I think it's just identifying words that can change from being okay, that can provoke a bit more conversation, that gets a little bit more out of someone and also reassuring someone that if they wanna talk, look, I'm here. Like, and just say, actually, I might want to talk about you, to you something as well. If you open up to somebody else, even though you think it's them that needs to open up, it opens the, the floodgates for that conversation. Sure. And that has been proven to work. Sure. It's just language. Yeah. And not asking a question that you can answer with yes or no. Yeah. Um, oh, someone there, please. Thank you. Can I just say something? It's not so much of a question, but it is a reiteration of something that you said that it touched me quite a lot which is that everyone has to have a belief and has to have a goal. As someone that has suffered from mental health for many more, many more years than you have, because I'm a lot older, <laughs> I Not know much, that you have to have a goal and you have to, to believe that eventually you are going to overcome that, no matter how much, the, what the degree of overcoming is. Mm. But so I just wanted to say thank you for you having said that, because for me, it is really important. You have to have a goal, no matter how small that goal is, yeah. no matter how small that dream is, it's not quantifiable, it's yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's brilliant words. Yeah, absolutely, because I think for me, that's the driver, that's the thing that keeps you going, that's the thing you're holding on to. Because that's the clearness that we do have in our head or the bit when you're in a really dark place, it still flashes in you know, the things that you want to do, the purpose that you have, because we do all have a purpose. Um, it is, but it is also about sharing that and communicating and try and get as much support as you can, because we can't all do it on our own as sure. much as we mm. want to. Sure. 
but they were really great words. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no. From, thank you. Yeah, please. Hi. Uh, nice to meet you. You're one Hi. of my childhood heroes. So. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, that's nice. I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned about when you joined the army and that you didn't want to um, say that you were a good runner and then you were beating all the men. <laughs> Have you found as a woman when you were entering such a male-dominated environment that you had to be better, you had to do more to be level with them or did you ever find any challenge like that in that environment as a woman? Oh yeah, I mean, found a lot of challenges, you know, and as I've gone through my different worlds, let's say, um, you know, you see the challenges in business, you see it in all around the world where women feel like they have to stand out. And I remember doing some women's networking before and they used to say, well, I keep going into a room full of men, you know, and I'm like, yeah. But all those men, mostly, when it was all business thing, are in suits and ties. I said, but you're the woman that is in your dress and stand out, so be seen, you know, kind of change it around a little bit. Instead of being, there's not many of me there, almost like, okay. So when I say to you, my name is Lorraine, okay, they're probably gonna remember Lorraine rather than the 10 Daves, the 10 this, the 10 that, that they've seen in there, you know? So change your way around. And sometimes, yes, we have to try a bit harder, but don't always pull it into a negative of it. What can you take from a positive of being slightly different or in an environment that um, isn't, you know, isn't accept acceptable uh, for women. But going back to your point, when I was in the army, I did do this one thing. I mean, it was a little bit naughty, but um, so I was a corporal at uh, this barracks. It's quite ironic, actually, because this is also the barracks that I got raided and completely humiliated and destroyed at. But um, I was at um, this barracks and I was a corporal. So one of my eyelashes has fallen off. They're not all mine. Um, <laughs> It's <laughs> being real here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, uh, so I was at this barracks and I'm a corporal and without these high heels on, I'm five foot four. And uh, these were all men coming, or boys coming from university who wanted to be officers. And prior to going to Sanders as the officer training unit, they come to Beaconsfield. So when they come to there, they learn army law and have to be fit enough to go to become an officer or train to become an officer. So I was in charge of the whole unit at the time because my sergeant hadn't been replaced. So they come into my gym, 30 of them as an intake is, all six foot something, and they're looking and they're all talking. Well. What the first thing you learn in the army is that when you go into a PTI, a physical training instructor's gym, you don't say a word mm -hmm. because in that world, I can tell you exactly what you've got to do and you can't moan. That's one of the one good thing about the army. You can just get people to do the jobs and they do them. And especially in physical training, you know, I could beast them, meaning like I can give them every part of that physical training so they're broken if I wanted to. However, I thought, no, nah, I'm going to change this because I've got to gain respect so that this goes like wildfire fire around, like don't mess with this little, you know, woman in the gym type thing. Mixed race woman, five foot four in the gym, don't mess with her. That's what I wanted. So anyway, so they come in, I said, right, okay, I've got a challenge for you. Remember I hadn't told many people that I was a really good athlete and things? I'm 22 by this stage and um, they know, didn't know that I'd been army champion since I joined and inter services champion since I joined and all this. I said, right, I've got this challenge. I've got a three mile run, it goes around, uh, it goes out the gate, it's about 100 metres away. You go past all this sort of course, through the forest, come out to this big, open, massive expanse, very undulating, back through the forest, woodland, come back through this sort of case, through the gate to the gym. I said, we'll go for this run. I said, anyone that beats me back doesn't have to do PT at all for two weeks. <laughs> doesn't have to come in my gym, do anything physical for two weeks. Anyone that comes in behind me comes in at five o'clock in the morning and eight o'clock at night, because I live on this barracks and I don't care and I love my job. And I said, do you want to go for it? And they were like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. I mean, why wouldn't you take out that challenge? Mm -hmm. So of course, I figured they'd been to university, probably had a bit of drinking, you know, kind of not really looked after themselves. I just gathered that because when I joined the army, that's all I did. Um, and uh, so I thought, right, here we go. Went out. <laughs> I shut the, the gate behind me. I was the last person. And off we go for the run. I gathered by the time I'd got past the assault course that most, uh, most of them would be knackered because they went off like hares. Yes, that 
that was validated, that it happened. Went through the woodland, you know, one by one they're dropping off because of course they've just gone for it. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, it's three miles and this is a blooming hard route. I'm pacing this like I did at the Olympics. Start at the back, come through. Anyway, so we go round and we've got this undulating bit. And in the distance, I see this sort of five guys. I'm thinking, oh, they're quite good. So I kind of had to start stepping up. So I'm going round now and then it gets to three coming out of the woods the other side to the salt course. Well, I close the gate. So in my head, I'm thinking, right, those three, they've got to stop at the gate. So as I start, I'm catching them up. Pass one just before the gate, two more at the gate. In my head, suddenly, Linford Christie from 1992 Olympics, who won 100 metres, gold medal for Great Britain, came in my head. It was 100 metres to that gym door. I was like Linford Christie. I was literally like, oh, and his legs. I was sprinting, ducked at the gym, beat all 30 back. They came in looking at me like, Ugh! Like this whole, like, oh my God, what is this woman? So I'm going, get down, you know, like, get me down. <laughs> I'm going to give you a bit, you know, the whole big, oh, comes out. You know, this little mild, meek little woman, like suddenly bellowing from her stomach, like we got taught as a PTI, you know, comes out. And then I go, right, in my gym, get out that rope, arms only. They're like falling off the rope, can't even hold on to it. I'm going, shut up, get out of the way. I'm like, dum, 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 dum. no legs, arms only, come back down. They're like, <laughs> could see them all going <laughs> oh dear like that anyway I went that was a great session get back here five o'clock in the morning and that was it that went round my unit no one ever came into my gym about speaking so sometimes you don't have to really belittle them by words you just show how good you are at something show them your role show them your job they get a bit overwhelmed by it a bit baffled by the fact how much you know that's an any job. You know, whatever job you do, somebody coming who's no doesn't know your job. And if you think they're giving you attitude, go, right, I want you to do blah, 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 blah. They sit there like, uh, I haven't got a clue. Get the respect, that's it. Move on. Thank you. Anyway, that was just a story. Why, 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 did, we, <laughs> why, did, why did we know I you were going to say... I stories. But, uh, yeah. we, we, we knew you were going to say that you beat all those men, so... I had... Well, no, I just... I, <laughs> that question really is that I just believe that I didn't want to give anybody something that I couldn't do myself, especially being a PTI. And yeah. when you're judged as a woman against male PTIs, you have to prove that you're good. And most of the people I trained were men. So I don't want to be like this ridiculous PTI that no one respects. So I was like, I want to be really good at my job. And hence why the, the conflict of the law and keeping it, you know, everyone knew everyone that was gay, but you do it sort mm. of, you go out of barracks and away from the environment uh, to be with your mates and to be normal. And then you come back in and you don't talk about it. But there was a purpose, a point of being, um, uh, knowing that I wanted to be respected for being good at my job. And I was a good instructor. I brought people to the highest standards, but I did it through respect and sure. not just by their physical attribute, by their mindset. I wanted these to be really good soldiers all across my career. And hence why I used to use up my leave to go away and compete when I became an international athlete. Okay. And yeah. I got um, my MBE for services to the army for that. So for my career as a soldier, so I'm proud of it. Thank you, Dane Kelly. We're out of time, I'm afraid. Um, but we have one last thing to give you. Um, do we have the, the two Johns? Is coming in. <laughs> easy, easy, really? please. No, no. Um, do we have a mic? Whoops. So we have John and John from the trim shop. Mm -hmm. um, and they've made you something very special. Do, do you want to explain what it is, John? Well, for our VIP guests, we tend to make some mouse mats so they can remember their experience, especially with the factory tour. So mm -hmm. what we've done, we've created you a personalised mouse mat <laughs> to remember your time here. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Yes, Is it so the best I'll ever? It's the best mouse mat we've ever made. <laughs> and it's just for you. Oh. Yeah. Your gold medal. There we go. It's also got the red, white and blue. Oh my God, that's brilliant. Oh, thank you. The Bentley logo. There we go. Thank awesome. you, John. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's so lovely. Can we have a photo? Will yeah. I do photos? Yeah, yeah. Oh, John, give me the... Social media, of course. Oh, my God. oh, I was about to sing. Oh, no. <laughs> Can I crack on if you want? I'll tell you what, let's do a selfie this way round so we get everybody in it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Right, you go there, I'll go here, and I can get everybody in. Please smile, don't ruin the photo. <laughs> there you go, just take a few. 
Oh, get the yeah, red welcome bow in. There you go. Excellent. Thank, right, you thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's nice. Uh -huh. So thank you again. We must send you off down the M6 now for your somewhat lengthy journey yeah, back, to, back Kent. to Kent. Yes. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed yourself here. Um, it's been great, thank you. We've been taking f photographs and video during the afternoon, which we'll send over to you. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to put that on your social channels, and we're going to yeah. do some of that as well. And the documentary, ITV Hub. Yeah, ITV Hub, Kelly and Spee and Me. Still there, so please. And if, if you are interested in the veterans thing, you want to hear some of the stories just to get context of what I've said, then uh, they're in the Sunday Mirror, it's online, and in the Mirror on okay. uh, this Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good luck, Jeffrey. Thank you.